Loco and Apologia, and another episode of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. A few weeks back, when PZ Myers was on the show, I said that anyone whom Ken Ham had personally called out by name was welcome here, which caught the attention of... Arn Ra, how do you do? Crazy, right? And how did you come by these credentials, Arn? Uh, Ken Ham was... I went to his art park when they first opened it up. I went there to protest, of course. And the funny thing was like the day before I got there, I, I found out from a link on Australian news that he was telling his congregation to pray for me because I'm so deluded that I know something better than he does. Yeah, well, knowing something that Ken Ham doesn't is hardly an exclusive club. <laughs> I've said this to you before, but I'll just thank you once again publicly for your role in educating me out of and after my life in Young Earth Creationism. Your channel and your book and your work is just so important. I say often that, that a great many of our best activists and advocates for reason and rationality were raised in young earth creationist environments. At least it wasn't flat earth. Oh, you know, you've got stupid people and you've got insane people. Indeed. Well, let's get started. Hi, and welcome to Answers News for June. No, June is July. June, July. <laughs> I'm so right. often last month. No, there's PhD, molecular genetics, as if there's some other kind. What school or mail order catalog did that? She got it from Ohio State University which is pretty legitimate for someone working in creation ministry. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow's actually the anniversary for the Ark. It's been open for one year. So what do you remember about that day? You were there. <laughs> yeah, I remember almost nobody showed up. That's, <laughs> that's what I remember. I, I remember it was a school bus full of kids, and they got to see all our protest signs, including mine that said that you know the Noah's Ark never happened. This is a fairy tale. And I hope that some of those kids, at least one of those kids, put two and two together. And if they didn't understand it from the sign, they probably would have figured it out once they got on the boat-shaped building because it's a complete farce. It is stunning to me how anybody believes this. But the purpose of this whole Ark Park was that Noah's Ark is easily the most absurd of all the fables in the Bible. I mean, it is as ridiculous as anything can be. And so if you can't believe Noah's Ark, you can't believe the rest of it. So you've got to find a way to make that believable. But the first thing that they realized was wrong with it was when they tried to put, when they had the idea of put, putting live animals on there, they realized just the amount of upkeep that was necessary. It was going to require more than eight people. Not even for the 1,400 animals. If you had 140 animals, 140 pairs of animals, you weren't going to be able to do that. They were not, like eight people couldn't have done it. And this is with air conditioning and ventilation systems and modern plumbing. They still couldn't do it. So now think about five, 6,000 years ago, you know, how were they going to do it then? Right? With, with, with eight people, with when the, the Bible says the boat had one window. So it's amazing to see how far we've come, you know, yeah. over the last year yeah. when, when we were just... Um, yeah, and the numbers are still incredible oh for people coming gosh. to the arts. Yeah, the numbers are so incredible because they only got half the attendance that they originally estimated. They were expecting to do something like two million a year, and they're claiming, they're claiming one million. Now, we have reason to doubt everything they've ever said about this, because if they're claiming a million, I would, I would bet that if they, maybe they got a few hundred thousand, they might have gotten 800,000, but I don't think they got a million. Because they have a tendency to fudge everything. They're fraudulent is what they are. I mean, for example, they set this thing up as a, as a for-profit amusement park. And Ken Ham was building it like it was some kind of damn Disneyland with no rides. We're talking about a museum dedicated to willful ignorance, to lying to children and old people. They created this property out of donations. They got people to donate hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property and, and funds as well so that they could put together this boat-shaped building that they could pretend was an art, just so they could impress people and make it look like the story is believable, when it's, it's still not. But what they did was they took all these, all these donations, and then they got state credits, like $18 million worth of tax breaks from the surrounding community on the promise that they were going to build up all of this uh, revenue. And so the people in the surrounding town hired all of these extra hands and everything so that they could be, be built up for the numbers necessary for this huge visitor flow that was going to come and, and revigorate the town. But none of that happened. So the people behind the town were complaining that the Ark had not delivered on any of its promises. So what they did, they were facing $700,000 in taxes on this $48 million piece of real estate. So Ken Ham took it from his for-profit organization and put it in his, not, his non-profit organization. Still belongs to him. He sold it to his non-profit company for $10 just so that he could get out of paying $700,000 in taxes. Yeah, we've been covering that here. And just as an update for the audience, a lawyer for the Kentucky Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet sent a letter last week to the lawyer for the Ark Encounter to rescind the original $18 million sales tax incentive. The letter quotes AIG's website to prove they were aware that this program is not available to nonprofits, then says that due to the ownership change that no further incentives are available to them as of June 28th. So now they're losing $18 million to save the 700000 
and to rub salt in the wound? One of the Georgetown council members suggested it would be a trivial matter during their next session to make the safety tax apply to nonprofits as well. Basically, this entire thing is backfiring in the worst possible way for the ARC. So the whole thing, every part of it, is a scam. It is as, it is as uh, dishonest as anything can be. I wonder if part of the resistance to the tax was really to avoid giving a public record of how many tickets they sold. And a religious organization doesn't have to report these things, which is what makes religion the greatest scam. I mean, they could literally put snake oil on the shelves and sell it. So we're going to talk about a 99 million year old bird. Hey, I, I wonder if the dates are wrong on that. <laughs> I wonder if the dates are wrong. Uh, yeah, this, uh, the 99 million year old bird that they're talking about is one that was encased in amber. They don't date the amber directly. They date the amber by the surrounding uh, strata. So what they did is that they first did the index fossils, which is common. I mean, you find other fossils that are in the, in the same uh, strata, the same layer, whatever. And these should give you an indication. That's all it is. It's just an indication. But then, uh, if, because it's in Burma, the Burmese amber can be dated by the zircons in that strata. So they used potassium lead dating for this, and they came up with an absolute date. And so we can say that it's absolutely that, yeah. An absolute date of 98.8 million years old, give or take 0.6 million years for that deposit. So I wonder if they got the dates right. This guy pulls out of his ass just so he can, he can question reality, because that's what creationism is. It is a denial of reality. It is literally a delusion. A delusion is defined by, by psychiatrists as being a fixed false belief that will not change despite evidence to the contrary. Yeah, so this this is a nearly complete bird that's been encased in amber, which is fossilized mm -hmm. tree sap in Burma. Um, and it had half of the bird's entire body, including a wing, claws, and a head. So they basically say, well, while it, it would have looked a lot like our modern day birds, some of the features on it really are more uh, true of primitive birds. Primitive birds. By primitive birds, she means that this is an enantiorni. And when they talk about kinds a lot, these creationists do, because they don't have any kind of classification and no, no means of determining that. And I, and I explained that in the phylogeny challenge. But in this case, we're talking about a type of bird that no longer exists. Uh, imagine that we have all the birds that we have alive in the world today fall into two basic categories, paleonase and neonase. But if you go back into the Cretaceous, you get three more different, three more categories of birds that no longer exist. Uh, the the Ichthyornis, the, the Hesperornis, and the, the Enantiornis. And this is also can uh, include some of like things like uh, Confucius Ornithus and things like that. These are birds that are very different from modern birds. They have a different type of plumage, particularly in the tail. They still have fingers in their wings. How about this bird? How can you pronounce that bird? That's a Haitsen. That's a juvenile Haitsen. It looks like Hotsen, but it's Haitsen. And uh, it lives down in South America, and the juvenile form of it runs around, crawls around in trees. And uh, it actually, if you look carefully, it's got claws on the end of its wings, you know, reaching mm -hmm. out there, just like these do. Archaeopteryx. And, so there and are birds bird that have claws. Like yeah, there are birds that have claws. The juvenile Hotsen has claws in its wings, uh, and a lot of people bill it as being the only bird, the only extant bird, that still has fingers in its wings. That's not actually true. I had, a, I had an emu as a pet. The emu has arms, not wings. They have arms. Uh, that like like T-Rex had. They have tiny little diminutive arms, just like a Tyrannosaurus, except that instead of having two claws, they have one. They have one finger, and on the end of that finger is a claw. And what makes that interesting is that the finger and the arm itself do not have musculature to move. They are completely vestigial. These are arms that are, that are underneath that layer of feathers, so most people can't see them. You have to pull the feathers aside to, to find that arm, and it is not possible to move the arm. So what is the purpose of the claw? on the arm. It's vestigial because it's a remnant of when they were, you know, the Mesozoic type dinosaurs. Now, birds are still dinosaurs right now. Dinosaurs in the same sense that, you know, a mallard is a duck and I, and all mallards are ducks, but they're not the only ducks. And then, you know, all ducks are birds. And of course, all birds are dinosaurs in the same sense. And came up with an article mm -hmm. that talks about 10 amazing birds with teeth. Now, they're not necessarily teeth like teeth we right, have, that's right, but they are teeth. There's for, a type of goose, a gray lag goose that has teeth. Nope. Nope, there is not. There is no bird. There is no extant bird that has teeth. Uh, teeth are you know, bony. They are enamel coated. They have roots. They grow out of the jaw or the mandible. And what she's talking about are subsequent serrations where the birds have lost the original teeth that they used to have and have tried to replace those with serrations in the beak, which are not structurally in or otherwise. They are not actual teeth. They're just serrations in the beak. Is that the same thing as atavism, like where some chickens are born with teeth? Atavisms usually show up only in the young or usually before they hatch. It's rare that you show an atavism that retains after that, but of course they don't understand that. 
Right. And they're going to try to say that if there is a bird that has claws, then that negates everything. And if there were other dinosaurs that lived after the first bird, then somehow, because they're thinking, you know, if, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? This is the kind of warped thinking they have to rely on and have, and you know, they know better. Of course. No Ken Ham has to know better, but he ha- but he is in a gig where he's got people that will give him hundreds of millions of dollars. And they have egg tooth. All birds, except I think one kind, have actually an egg tooth, which helps them break the out of the yeah. shells. No, no bird has an egg tooth. Uh, an egg tooth is not a tooth, and it's not just birds. All egg hatching animals have a bony protuberance that is called an egg tooth but it's not actually a tooth. Uh, you know, like chickens, for example, are like the lab rats of the, of the bird world. And uh, they have this gene where if you can turn that gene on, they'll actually grow teeth, mm-hmm. uh, which is quite fascinating. So birds have that ability. So the information is there. The information is yeah. there. It's just turned on or off. Yeah. What they're saying is that birds where no bird has actual teeth, the actual teeth would be rooted and would have, uh, it usually have blood uh, circulation in them as well so that these teeth can, can continue to grow and be replaced when they're broken off and so forth. So we're not talking about teeth here. And the fact that birds have genes to make these teeth when no bird has teeth. So what? how do you define that as an intelligent design? You know, evolutionary speaking, we have an explanation for this. They had teeth, but virtually everything that develops beaks also ends up losing teeth. So the beak has some different kind of uh, cutting scissor method that kind of supersedes teeth so they don't use it. And so that, there's an evolutionary explanation, but there is not a divine explanation. You know, I see these types of creatures, you know, buried in amber is more than likely time to flood. Buried in amber because of a flood. Amber is tree sap. Tree sap that happens to, you know, you can imagine a, a, a nest of little you know, baby birds. The, the, the tree is dripping sap, and of course it drips sap onto the bird. Now the bird is sitting case in this, and he literally drowns in the tree sap, which hardens over time, and obviously was not the product of a flood. It couldn't have happened. If there had been a flood, that bird may, would have drowned some other way, but it wouldn't be an amber uh, These are, you know, when they say 100 million years ago, that's right in the middle of flood sediment. 99 million years is right in the middle of flood sediment. Bullshit. <laughs> 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 how, do, how do you identify this? I mean, it's like when they, when they go to try to, to, to date the, the rocks of the Grand Canyon, I and mean, they take all these different layers, and then they just put them into three categories. You know, during flood, post-flood, pre-flood. That's literally what they do. They don't have any means to do that. Is everything from the Cambrian up is going to be right in the middle of their mythical flood deposit, which actually does not exist anywhere. We have evidence of local floods. We have local floods showing up all over the place. Uh, we have evidence of huge floods showing up in specific places for specific times, but these are isolated and tied to specific events, and they don't coordinate with each other. So we know that there was no flood. There was no global flood. That never happened. And I just think, okay, on the ark, floating above all this stuff, when this stuff is dying and being fossilized, there are doves on the ark with Noah right there. No. Nope. <laughs> all right, so if, if anybody watching this who does not know, I did a, a series of eight videos on how meteorology disproves the flood, how geology disproves the flood, how uh, paleontology disproves the flood, how dendrochronology disproves the flood, how zoology disproves the flood, how anthropology disproves the flood, how archaeology disproves the flood, and how mythology disproves the flood. There is absolutely no chance that this that the, the, the world was globally flooded at any point and somehow we didn't notice. And there was a handful of other floods at different times. The Sea of Galilee 15,000 years ago, uh, uh, the Black Sea 7,000 years ago, lots of, and the Mediterranean. There were lots of different floods at different times. But there was never a global flood. All right, so this next one comes from Live Science. DNA, and again, DNA, solves 200-year-old mystery of weird Ice Age creature. Macrachinia patachinica? Okay, my last Don't you love scientific rusty. names? I mean, sometimes <laughs> scientific names are just out there. Right? Why can't we just talk about the dog kind and the cat kind? Simple. Stupid scientists. Yeah, you know, these scientific names, it's like they're speaking Latin or something. <laughs> so this thing has, like, um, a long neck, like a llama. It has three-toed feet like a rhino, and it has a tapir-like trunk. So it's got, it's kind of, I said, it's kind of like platypus, you know? Right. It's got this mixture of things. The platypus is not the chimera that they make it out to be. I mean, they lay leathery eggs, which hatch immediately, uh, and they have a sort of a leathery beak that's much different than the way a bird's beak would develop. They are an older, more primitive, more reptilian type of mammal. Again, if you go back to the fossil record, just like with the birds, if you go back to the fossil record, suddenly you have at least three more uh, huge groups. You have the paleorectoids, the multitubercles, and uh, triconodonts, I think, if I could remember them correctly. They're not, obviously, they don't come up in conversation very often. But all, and then there's a, a vast array of 
semi quasi reptilian mammaloid things where you, the, the, where the division between what is a reptile and what is a mammal is so blurred that you can't you can't put these things in one category or another. The transition was that smooth and took that long, and the platypus basically came out on the tail end of that, where it just has a few barely a few more reptilian traits than modern mammals do. And so the thing that she's talking about right now, the animal that the uh, Macrochinia, that, that she can't even, you know, I don't think I pronounce it correct either, uh, to be honest, but I had a toy of these, I remember when I was a kid. Uh, it's not that it has a chimera of different things like, why does it have traits from a rhino and traits from a horse and traits from you know, traits from a tapir? Because rhinos, tapirs, and horses are all parasodactyls. They're all in the same taxonomic family. They are the same thing. Now, answers in Genesis are not going to accept as that as being part of the horse kind. And they're not going to accept rhinoceroses and tapirs and horses together as one kind. They can't identify what a kind is, but they want to make sure that the horses are one kind and rhinos are something else. And so, it, again, it's all about misrepresentation and deliberate, willful ignorance. On the evolutionary yeah. tree, it just doesn't make any sense because right. it has so many different characteristics. Yeah, so yeah, there's nothing wrong with having what, what we call a mosaic or chimera, right. uh, you know, where it has a number of these features. A platypus is the great example mm -hmm. uh, that we see. That's not the only one. There's a number of different creatures like that. There's not actually one. <laughs> it's like that there is not a chimera in real life. I mean, well, and that's one of the ways that you could actually just prove evolution. If evolution was not true, then you have to think about the fact that everything we've ever invented for it, any of our fictional stories, whether it's mythology or movies or what have you, every new animal that we, that we conceive to, uh, to play the part in some story, even if it's supposed to be from Earth and it's supposed to have naturally evolved, every mythical beast of any kind has violated taxonomy right away. I mean, my favorite example is to look back to the old episodes of Godzilla. In the earliest movies of Godzilla, he had external ears and an actual nose, as well as canine teeth amidst all of the other teeth that he had. And so it's, all of these things are inconsistent with a reptile of any kind. And so this is just one example. I mean, and every other animal is like that. I mean, all the way down to, um, I mean, probably the most realistic of our, all of these mythical beasts is the jackalope. You know, we have a, a rabbit or a hare that has antlers because they're at least reasonably close to the type of ruminant that would actually have that kind of feature, but still violates taxonomy. So if you want to prove that evolution is not true, you just, just find anything that doesn't fit the taxonomy. And one example that I like to choose is, say, Pegasus, for example. And we know that the wings of birds, because birds are dinosaurs, so if a, pair, if a Pegasus, which is a horse, if it had the wings of a bird, then how do we have a mammal lineage that is, it has the endowment that, that is very specific, is very highly specific, couldn't possibly have evolved independently twice. Not just that the feathers are too, too complex to have evolved independently twice, but also the, the bony structure of the fused fingers of the dinosaur, three-fingered ha three hands, and you put all that onto a horse? No. One pegasus would reduce evolution to horse feathers. We can still prove that evolution happened, so that would create a huge quandary, but we would know that this thing did not evolve. That couldn't have happened. And so that would imply some other creative mechanism. This is a group that thinks that the hallucinations in the Book of Revelation and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe are both canon. So, so <laughs> from a creation perspective or a biblical perspective, we it could be its own unique kind, which we would say that's right. true of the platypus, um, mm -hmm. certainly, yeah. or it could be in a, a certain family. You know, there's more research that needs to be done to really right. ascertain that and look at that. There's no amount of research you could ever do to justify the biblical kinds, and that is the phylogeny challenge. Uh, it, it, it's to asking them to identify what is uh, what is related to other things and what is you know what is created unrelated to anything else, and they can't do that because they can't show a criteria. There's no way that you can divide. Let's say you know the birds, for example. You can say all the Bible says all these different kinds of birds, and then it also says all these different sorts of birds. What the hell a sort is, I don't know. They don't what a, what a kind is, we don't know because the people who wrote it didn't know. But then you have bird kind, right? Well, how do you identify the bird kind? Because when you get into the earliest birds, they're indistinguishable from dinosaurs. And likewise, the dinosaurs that were living around them at that time were indistinguishable from birds. For example, they were talking about it earlier. They were talking about that, that 99 million year old uh, amber in Burma that, that contained that baby bird. Well, they also have a 99 million year old amber dinosaur that had, the tail is included and the tail is covered in feathers. So now the answers in Genesis can't admit that the dinosaurs were covered in bed, and especially the, the part of the long tail, the part that they can't admit. Otherwise, if you if you didn't have the tail, they would just call it a bird. But because it's got a full long dinosaur tail, now you have to realize that it's a Mesozoic dinosaur and you can't classify it otherwise. And especially when it doesn't have wings, it just have has feathers because they also say you can't have such a thing as a half wing because they don't they don't realize that you know that's what an emu is. That's what an ostrich has, for example.
There are so many dinosaurs that you can find in the late Cretaceous that are virtually indistinguishable from birds. And there's some that are so far on that line, like Codipteryx suey, for example, that both the creationists and scientists who are trying to who are trying to make the distinction between you know any scientist who's still trying to hold out that birds are not dinosaurs is going to be have a hard time with with Codipteryx suey. Is it a bird? Is it a dinosaur? It is obviously both. And the creationists are rug divided on this too. The best way to tell whether a species is transitional is when creationists argue about whether it's 100% on this part of the side of the line or it's 100% on this side of the line. But they'll never admit that it's 70 or 90% anyway because it's got to be 100. There's got to be a solid division. There never well, is one but they have to pretend that it's there. So when you get to something like Codipteryx, you can't make that call. Is it a bird? They Is think it it's closely related um, to horses, rhinos, and tapirs. Um, so, because it does have some of those characteristics. But again, that's just DNA matching and you have to be right. a little careful with that. Just <laughs> DNA matching. That's all that is. I mean, that's no more accurate than identifying for certain who's really your father. That's, it's only DNA matching, which is only accurate enough to secure a criminal conviction for the death penalty, even in lieu of any other evidence. That's all how accurate that is. Then why would you want to trust something that is only as accurate as anything can be? But it is extinct, and that, that causes problems with us. You know, a kind, you know, like mm -hmm. dog kinds, cat kinds, you know, a good rule of thumb of that is if they can breed together, they're, right. they're definitely part definitely of the same kind. Same kind. Uh, within the dog kind, you have Lycaon pictus, better known as the uh, African painted wild dog. Now, these are not derived from wolves. They're clearly dogs. They're just not domestic dogs. You actually have a few species of dogs that are not derived from wolves. Wolves are derived from the broader category of dogs, and then you breed domestic dogs from wolves, from four different lineages of wolves. But you can't breed any domestic dog with an African wild dog. They are genetically distinct. Now, even though dogs will hump anything, including your knee, that doesn't mean that they will necessarily interbreed with anything. And so when there's a genetic distinction like this, they become different species. So he's saying that if they, can, if they can interbreed, then they're the same kind, which means species. He's saying that it's the same species. When we're talking about sexually reproductive animals, that's what that means. So he's saying that the dog kind actually has several different kinds within that kind. And he's not even aware of the borophagines and a host of the other ones and the myocids and so forth because they don't care about the paleontology. They don't even want to look into it. And then the fact that the dog kind and the cat kind are both the carnivore kind, and that, you know, just like you have basal to dogs, you have foxes, and basal to cats, you have civets, and then you've got a whole huge collection of different intermediaries there, too. Now, we're not even talking about the fossil record. We're talking about the stuff that still lives. That goes along with your caniform cladogram and feliform family videos. Those are nasty names. I'll put links to those in the description. Put those links in there, too. But, yeah, I, I did an evolution of dogs, evolution of cats. You'd be amazed at how integrated they are. And, and with everything else, and genetically too, but that's just DNA matching, and how could you trust that for anything other than a court of law? I mean, it's just one of those animals that's went extinct since the Ice Age, um, and so mm -hmm. we've lost that part, so to speak, or that either that kind yeah. or that member of a kind. Either yeah, so let's, let's talk about that. Since God said to Noah that all of the animals would come to him to be saved, and we now know through paleontology that there are more genera that are represented in the fossil record than exist today, so much so that what we have today what we have alive today, all the animals we have total alive today represent only 1% of all the genera that have ever lived. 1%. So what, what a fantastic failure was that arc, huh? So you have all these dinosaurs and you have all these, you know, therapsids and all of these other Ice Age beasties and, and, and all these, uh, the, the mesonychids. And we have several different lineages of animals, huge, diverse lineages with hundreds of species, all of which went extinct instantly as soon as they got off the boat what the hell happened there noah's boys got a little aggressive on the sacrificing <laughs> a little bit a little bit and so it is hard to study but it is unique to yeah. be able to see these things they kind of look like a weird horse I, think. I don't know if i can keep going on with this i can go as long as you need me to but these are just irritating and i'm going to start punching computer screen we've got two more if we can get through it this next article comes from Fox News. Bernie Sanders attacks Trump nominee for following the teachings of Christ. But it's not about their so-called wrong understanding of separation of church and state, because now it's all about you can't even be a Christian in any position. Right, you, you can yeah, have other religions. Religion. Sorry, I can't put up with any more of this. Well, there's no way that Ken Ham doesn't know he's lying at this point. You know, he knows that the founding fathers and you know founded this country based on the idea of religious freedom because most of the migrants that came here were fleeing religious persecution from other countries. And as soon as they got here, they immediately began to practice that on themselves so that the, the, so that the, the Puritans were torturing the Quakers and uh, the, the Spanish 
Spanish Catholics were uh, were wiping out the, uh, the the Native Americans for religious reasons, with religious punishments wholesale. So the founding fathers came up with the idea that you can't endorse a particular religion. The state cannot, because they realized that the only way to have freedom of religion was to have freedom from religion. Once the state has adopted a religion, then that religion becomes preferential over anything else. And everybody else then has to pay homage to the state religion, no matter what nonsense it is. So you don't have freedom of religion without freedom from religion. So it had to be completely secular. And some of the founding fathers held religious beliefs, but also had the wisdom to know that that's their belief. That's not the state belief. You can't allow the state to have its own belief. I do not have any respect for Christianity by any denomination. I don't have any respect for Islam either, none whatsoever, nor any other religion at all. But I have to respect that people have the right to believe whatever compels them, whatever makes sense to them. And likewise, people have the right to change their minds when it doesn't make sense anymore. But well, I, well, I believe that everybody has the, the, the right to their opinion, and you, you, can't, you can't impose a thought crime. You can't say that it's illegal for you to believe this. So I have to endorse people as an anti-theist, uh, a political activist. I have to endorse people's right to believe whatever the hell you believe for whatever reason you believe it. I can still criticize the belief, but we can't have, and what this is what they're talking about. They want people to profess the truth of their lies in such a way that they have legislation impose it since science will never stick up for them. Do you want me to jump ahead to the last one? I'm sorry, just, it, it, I know that a lot of people have problems like this. When you, when you listen to bullshit salesmen going on like this, I mean, Ken Ham and I have a bit of a history. I mean, you know, we mentioned that he called me out at one point, just you know, telling his, his uh, congregation to pray for me, but he did much worse than that with my wife. He actually made a video making fun of her for saying that, that humans are a subset of apes, which is a demonstrably factual statement. And he gets on and makes a video for all of his, you know, thousands of donors, wherein he's making fun of her for saying something so ridiculous, something that we could easily prove and did. Okay, well, this is the last one, unicorns. Okay, I think we're going we're gonna to skip ahead to the unicorns. Oh, yeah, let's go do the cool, unicorns. Because okay. we're running out of time. And yeah, we were going to talk about unicorns. unicorns. Always so. good to talk about unicorns once in a while. You know, if you yeah. watch YouTube videos or memes, apparently they poop glitter and fart rainbows. So, yay. That's a quote, right? Um, <laughs> Please tell me that's a quote. <laughs> it is. Well, the word unicorn is actually in some older translations of the Bible. Right. And so they say, well, the Bible's referring to unicorns. So how yes. can the Bible be true? And it's a good that, reminder. Right. That that. Yeah, I know that they're talking about rhinoceros. Uh, and they're going to try to say that because the actual name for the Indian rhino the Latin name is Rhinoceros unicornis. So it is literally an Indian rhino, is literally a unicorn. And if you go back and you read Job, I think it's 40, uh, where you start into Job's bestiary, when he describes the, the, the unicorn, he's clearly not talking about that diminutive little horse thing that, that is in, in medieval representations. We're talking about a massive, untrainable beast that you can't, you can't get to pull your plow for you, though it certainly has the strength to do that. But they're going to use that to try to defend the Bible as being legitimate, while at the same time, arguing that uh, behemoth is some sort of a sauropod. And this is another one of the lies that Ken Ham has to know better than. He knows he's lying on this point. They base the whole idea of the behemoth being a sauropod dinosaur on the one line that says that his tail moveth like a cedar. Yeah, the tail does move like a Middle Eastern cedar. It sways in the wind. It's not at all like an American cedar, which is this massive, stout thing. but um, the, the, the problem is they want to imply size on the tail, and they're ignoring other lines, like where it talks about the intelligence of this animal and the, and the way that it, it wades in the water and, and rests under the trees in a way that a, a massive sauropod wouldn't even be able to fit under these type of trees. They couldn't even get in there. But these are things that elephants clearly do. And then one of the lines about the behemoth is that the nose, not a horn on the nose, but the nose itself pierces snares, or there is a way to snare its nose. Well, sauropods literally don't have a nose, but that's kind of the thing that elephants are really known for. So it's clearly described, the behemoth is an elephant, it is not a sauropod dinosaur, and when creationists misrepresent it as a dinosaur, it is deliberately deceptive, at least in the case of someone like Ken Ham, who should really know better, and we know he does know better. But he said this once, in a, in a conversation with Hugh Ross, he said that he's seen the evidence. He's seen fossils that are 65 million years old that show a dinosaur that had brain cancer. Well, how could that be? Because his magic book of fables said that God created everything and said that it was good. So if, it, if this happened before you know, the sin of man, then it can't be good. So therefore, you throw out the evidence to believe in the fairy tale. And that is literally his position. He said that if you want to believe in salvation, which is the back half of the book, then you have to believe in creation, which is the first half of the book. So you've got to make believe. And he, he, he described it as putting on your God glasses. 
so that you would say you put on your God glasses, which is another uh, another word for confirmation bias, and you say, ah, now I can understand. Um, fossils formed before you know, couldn't have formed before sin. There was no death before sin. The, the flood connects to geology, and and you know God made different kinds of animals and plants that connects to biology and so on. So you just literally ignore everything we know to be true and everything we know to be false in order to believe in this magic book of fables, which we know is not true, not at not at all, not on any part. It's not the Bible is not just wrong scientifically and historically. It's wrong ethically and morally. It's wrong every way that it can be wrong. It's absolutely wrong about absolutely everything. And anything that you can find, where you can find one line where it is justified or actually accurate in the Bible, you just flip the page a couple of times and you'll find where the Bible contradicts itself on that very point. You know, there, there's a passage of wisdom in it. I can't say there's no wisdom in the Bible. There is. In Ecclesiastes 3, 18 to 21 is the only passage of wisdom I found in that Bible, and it contradicts the entire rest of the book. Well, that sounds like a great place to end it. Probably no point in carrying on from there. Do you have a last word for everyone? Uh, I just really appreciate where you've still paused the video at this point, right where there's right, right there where she's picking her nose. That's that's choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that may have sucked some of the power out of your eloquent wrap up. If for some reason you're not already subscribed to Aaron's channel, fix that immediately. He's one of our greatest champions against irrationality and pseudoscience. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. This was fun. If you'd like to be notified about new episodes of Ham and Egg News or my regular science and theology videos, tap that subscribe button. And follow me on Twitter or Facebook at Apologia Zero for creation updates and my written ramblings. Until next time, later.